Hello my darlings, welcome back to my YouTube channel. My name is Garabo Sitole and I'm a student from the University of the Edward Rand studying Bachelor of Accounting Science. So in today's video we are going to be doing monitoring jobs and inflation. This is going to be a very very short video. If you haven't subscribed as of yet, please make sure you click that subscribe button so that you're part of our family. So let's get right into it. So in today's video, as I said, we are talking about monitoring jobs, meaning we have to look at unemployment, right? So in economics, we look at a very narrow definition of what unemployment is, right? We don't look at the broad definition. So in economics, when someone says you are unemployed, you need to meet this category. You must be without work in the reference week, meaning when the survey was done. You must be willing, able, and actively looking for work. So if you're staying at home, you're not looking for work, then you are not unemployed. You are either marginally attached or... Sorry about that. You are either marginally attached or you are a discouraged worker. Right? So let's look at the narrow definition yet again. You must be without work in the reference week, meaning when the survey was done, you must be without work. You must be willing to work. You must be able to work. You must be actively looking for work, right? Or you must be planning to start a business in the next four weeks from when the survey was done, right? So we also have a broad definition of what unemployment is, right? So there is narrow definition and broad definition. So with the broad definition, you will take the narrow definition. However, you will also add discouraged weapons, right? I hope you guys understand. So there are three measures of unemployment. We look at the unemployment rates, which is equal to the number of people that are unemployed over the labor force. What is the labor force? The labor force is the number of people that are employed Number of people employed plus the number of people unemployed. So they can ask you to calculate the narrow unemployment rates or they, they can ask you to calculate the broad unemployment rates. So on the narrow unemployment rate, you will only base your calculation on the definition of the narrow unemployment, meaning that there will be no discouraged workers. Right, because in the narrow, you must be able to work, willing to work, and planning to start a business in the next four weeks. But if they ask you for the broad definition, you will take everything that you did here on the narrow. However, you will add your discouraged workers in your numerator as well as your denominator. If you need an example on how to do the, this, the broad one, please make sure you watch my video on test one, 2023. Yeah, semester one, that test. Okay. And then the second measure is measuring the labor force absorption rates, right? So we are looking at, um, excuse me, sorry, 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 sorry. It's the labor force participation rates, not absorption rates. Labor force participation rates. So it's the labor force participation rates. And here we are looking at the labor force over the working age population, right? And by working age population, I mean the economically active, the economically active participants, right? Also, I went quite in depth with an example on how to calculate these things on my video. So please make sure you watch it. But we're looking at people who are above 16 and less than 64 years of age. So those are the working age population. So it's going to be those in the labor force that are between 16 and 64, as well as those that are not in the labor force, but between the ages of 16 and 64. So that's how you calculate it. And then we look at what we call the absorption rates. So these are the number of people that are employed over the working age population. For those of you who are using, if you're from VIRTS and you are using the lecture slide notes, they made a mistake there. If you check your textbook, it says the number of people that are employed, not the number of people that are unemployed. So it's the number of people employed over the working age population, right? And then we look at the important types of unemployment. 
so we have what we call marginally attached workers right these are people that are neither working nor working what am i saying not the same thing these are people that are not working neither are they working nor are they working <laughs> right that means you're not working but you are not not working right so when you are marginally attached it means that you're not looking for work meaning you not fall you don't you don't fall under the unemployment rates but you are not working right so you are neither unemployed nor employed is what i'm trying to say so a marginally attached worker is a worker so a marginal a marginally attached worker becomes discouraged if they have been looking for work but they stopped because they couldn't find any so if you are a marginally attached worker meaning which you are neither employed nor unemployed and you stopped looking for work because you have been looking for it for such a long time that you have stopped then you are what we call a discouraged worker right and then we have and the second important definition of unemployed of unemployment and it is called the cyclical unemployment so cyclical unemployment is unemployment that occurs because you are at a certain point in the business cycle. You don't need to worry about a business cycle, but this is how it looks like. So you have an increase, get to the peak, having a, have a decrease, get to the trough, have an increase, get to the peak, and it continues on and on. So when you're at the peak, things are doing very, very well in the economy. However, there's inflation because there's a lot of demand and demand is greater than supply. And then after that peak, things will start slowing down, 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 down until it gets really bad and it gets to a drought. So that period, we call it a recession. And then it goes up, the expansionary period, and then you go to the peak, on and on. So any unemployment that occurs because you are at different phases of your business cycle is what we call cyclical unemployment. And then we look at what we call fictional unemployment. Fictional unemployment is unemployment that you get when you're moving from one job to the other. So if you retired from company A to company, if you retired from company A and then you started working at company B, the in between of you retiring and getting a new job is what we call fictional unemployment. Structural unemployment is unemployment that occurs because of techn technological changes, right? So for example, um, jobs that use, for example, a coffee machine, before a coffee machine was invented, there was someone who was actually making the coffee, right? Like every step of making coffee. But now that they are coffee machines, the coffee is going to do most of the jobs. You just need to be putting things in the coffee machine, right? So that's what we call structural unemployment. It is unemployment that occurs because um, there are technological changes, right? And then we have what we call the natural rate of unemployment. So the natural rate of unemployment occurs when you only have fictional unemployment and structural unemployment, no cyclical unemployment. So when the employment rate is equal to the full employment, when the employment rate is equal to the natural rate of unemployment, we say that you have full employment. Meaning full employment occurs when you only have fictional unemployment and structural unemployment. Let me repeat. Nature, the natural rate of unemployment is unemployment that occurs when you only have fictional unemployment and structural unemployment. And we say that the economy is at full employment when there is only fictional unemployment and structural unemployment. This is because it's, there's no way that you're going to have zero unemployment, right? So there's a healthy level of unemployment, right, that we need to have in the economy. And we call that what? Natural rate of unemployment. So here, there is no inflation. So when you are at the natural rate of unemployment, inflation is zero, right? So also, the natural rate of unemployment tells you that you are um, operating at a potential GDP, right? Meaning you are using your resources to a maximum. There is no output gap. Output gap is a gap that you get when the potential GDP is not equal to the actual GDP, which will cause inflation. So when you are not producing at your maximum, right, it means that your potential will be less than your actual, right? So just to emphasize on that, and then let us look at what we call inflation. Just want to make sure you guys can still see me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So let us look at what we call inflation. So inflation is a constant rise in the price levels over time. 
So if one good, if bread just increases on its own, that's not inflation. Inflation needs to be the general, I should have added that the general constant rise in the price level and it needs to be over time. So there could be a general increase in one month or in, in one day and then the next day things are just fine, back to normal. That's not inflation. Inflation needs to be over time. Don't ask me what period over time is. They just say over time. So just take that, that is over time. Right? So how then do we measure inflation? Inflation is measured by what we call the consumer price index. So let's look at how to calculate the consumer price index so that we can get to inflation. So the consumer price index, an index is a number that can be any number. It can be zero, it can be 10, it can be 20, it can be 100, it can be 110, it can be 120, right? So a CPI index measures the price levels of a fixed basket of goods and services that is consumed by a typical household. So you're going to have a fixed basket of goods and services in which we will measure the price changes. I emphasize that a fixed price basket, sorry, a fixed basket of goods and services. So I made a mistake in one of my videos and I'm going to correct that mistake here because I kind of misunderstood what basket, what fixed basket means, right? So those of you who saw the mistake, the mistake, please make sure see, you, you get clarification on this video. So I'm going to have an example on how to calculate the CPI index, right? So I need to emphasize I made this mistake, hence I'm like um, telling you guys so that you don't make the same mistake as I did because I won't make it again. So the basket is fixed to the base year, right? So you're going to calculate the cost of the CPI fixed basket at current prices. And then you're going to calculate the cost of the same fixed basket yet, but now at base year prices, right? So let's do that. So I said that the basket is fixed to the base year. So in this example, you can assume that the base year is 2013. So meaning that the basket, I'm going to fix the basket to the 2013 quantities. So these are the quantities that I'm going to use, but then I'm going to be using different prices. So I fix the basket and then I look at current prices, right, over... So I'm going to multiply the same quantities with different prices. So let us calculate the CPI for, 20, for 2014. I also want to calculate for 2013 so that you see why the CPI index for the base year will always be 100. So you will fix the basket and then you will, multi, you will find the cost of the CPI fixed basket at current prices. So in 2014, so the current prices are these ones. So I'm going to be saying 40, 40 times 45 plus 50 times 80 plus 10 times 105, right? Over the very same basket, meaning the very same quantities in my base year, times the base year prices. So it's going to be 40 times 50 plus 50 times 60 plus 10 times 100, right? Okay. okay, so that is the CPI for 2014. You get 114,16. So if you had to calculate the CPI for the base year, you'd see that it would give you 100 because you would multiply this by this, this by this, this times this, and then you would divide by the very same thing because it's the current prices over base year prices, which should give you 100. So... Then after you have calculated your CPI index, um, you would then calculate the inflation rates. Let's calculate the inflation rate for 2014. So it's going to be the new um, CPI index, which will be 114,16 minus the old. The old one will be the Bayesian one. And I said that the CPI index for the Bayesian will always be 100. So it's minus 100 over 100 times 100, meaning that you will have a 14,16 percentage. Inflation rates, inflation rates. Okay, so this mistake was done in the past paper that I said you guys should watch. Okay, we are almost there. My hands are so oily. My hands, my hands have oil. Sorry about that, guys. And then we look at what we call the 
personal consumption expenditure deflator. Any deflator is nominal over real times 100. So they are talking about personal consumption, meaning you have nominal personal consumption over real personal consumption. And then we look at the GDP deflator, which will be nominal over real, nominal GDP over real GDP. So there you are, guys. I hope this helps. Thank you so much. In the next video, I'm going to be looking at economic growth. Please be on the lookout. Thank you so much for watching. And please don't forget to subscribe to my video, to my YouTube channel. And please like share the link to my YouTube channel so that people will also subscribe. Road to 1K subscribers. Then 10K, then 100K, then 200K, then a million, then, 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 then. Then the rest will be history. Bye, guys.